This is the Rowlett Conservation Commission meeting of May 5th, 2015. This meeting of the Rowley Conservation Commission is hereby called to order under the authority of Mass General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Town of Rowley's Wetlands Protection Bylaw and the Storm Water Management and Erosion Control Bylaw. This meeting is being audio and visually recorded. I will now call the roll for attendance. David DeMonico, absent. Bob Garner, here. Judy Keyes, here. Sam Strife, here. Arthur Page. Here. Kirk Turner. Here. And Doug Watson is absent also. So the first order of business would be to entertain a motion for Kirk Turner as vice chair to serve as acting chair in the absence of Doug Watson. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I guess I'm stuck with it. <laughs> that was unanimous, so there would be no opposition. Yes. <coughs> Nobody else wants it. <laughs> yeah, well, for the high pay that we just voted in, right? <laughs> um, so for administrative type business? I usually spend 15 minutes doing administrative type stuff, so. It'll be a few minutes before we get going on the regular agenda. First item is scheduled for 7.45. Okay, I have received a communication from <clears throat> the town administrator's office from her executive administrative assistant uh, that notes that commissioners' appointments that are on record as expiring on June 30th, 2015 are Kurt Turner. And Robert Garner. We would be honored and oh so grateful if you would consider in communication requesting reappointment, which can be as succinct as an email to the selectman that just says that you wish to be considered for reappointment. did not give me a requested um, time period to do that, but if you have the opportunity over the next week or two, that would probably <coughs> mesh with their schedule so they're able to consider the reappointments prior to expiration. Okay, John. And if you could please copy our office because we would like to support. <coughs> you don't hear anything. Page. Put out a reminder in a couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so noted. And for anyone who was not in attendance at the town meeting last night, um, besides the budget considerations, etc., which were passed as recommended by the FinCon committee. The Commission had interest in Article 20 um, on the Town Meeting Warrant in regards to authorizing the Board of Selectmen to transfer tax title land consisting of 2.01 acres <clears throat> on Assessor's Map 17, Block 20, Lot 41 at 9 Turcotte Memorial Drive to the Conservation Commission for conservation purposes. That was unanimously passed. That is directly abutting the, I think they called that West Ox Pasture Village. That, yeah. So it's directly abutting the previously gifted open space lands within that development that were part of the CBA's approval for that development. So that will actually be good uh, additional habitat to that conservation area. I believe I also passed out, you should find uh, two sheets of paper underneath your agenda. Uh, Jean Blanchard and our senior assistant and myself have modified our two application checklists, one for the request to determine applicabilities and the other for notice of intent applications to include the request for one electronic 
submittal to accompany mm -hmm. the other documentation. Which, as previously discussed with the Commission, we can waive if circumstances uh, make that requirement either overly burdensome to the applicant or just not necessarily that appropriate for uh, less complicated applications. everything on the agenda tonight did not have a requirement to be advertised so therefore it is not specifically restricted to the Commission taking it up um, out of its <coughs> proposed sequence or time slot. Does that include the 745 item? Oh yes for sure. Yeah. All right. In fact there's probably not going to be anyone in attendance for that so. All right. Um. So that we do have um, our 8 o'clock notice of violation for 893 Havel Street. Um, Mr. Joseph Wright is here in the audience. All right, why don't we take that up first then, since we don't want to keep these people away from the Red Sox game. So whatever is their pleasure. <laughs> Why don't you come, come on up, Mr. Wright. You don't have to stand. Please feel free to sit. Okay, thank you. Status report under the heading of permits and enforcement. Uh, we've got at least two of these tonight. Notice of violation at 893 Haverhill Street, map 4, parcel 35, lot D, owned by Joseph and Joy Wright. Alteration and placement of building 100 foot buffer zone to BBD and 200 foot riverfront area. Would you like to summarize where we stand on all this? Um, yes. Um, brought to the attention of the office and through a review of the aerial uh, photography the town developed in its pictometry program in 2014. It was noted on Mr. Wright's property that there appeared to be development activity that when the house was constructed wasn't originally proposed that ventured into the 200 foot riverfront area of Muddy Creek. Uh, which is a resource area under the Wetlands Protection Act for uh, perennial streams. Um, a notice of violation letter was sent uh, to Mr. Joseph and Ms. Joy Wright on April 23rd, and Mr. Joseph Wright contacted uh, me in the office, and we arranged appointment on the 29th, I think it was. Yes. <clears throat> um, where I met Mr. Wright, and we went to the rear of his property, and taking advantage of the fact that an abutting property had a uh, wetlands professional perform a delineation 
that extended onto Mr. Wright's property, we utilized a hung wetlands flag uh, to measure and to make an on-the-ground determination that uh, some of the grading, clearing, and filling um, had occurred within the 100-foot buffer zone of bordering vegetated wetlands. By extension, because the bordering vegetated wetlands is associated with Muddy Creek and not far removed from the river channel, um, it is a, uh, a supportable and reasonable presumption to assume that 200 feet uh, from the close proximity of that wetlands flag is more than likely a good approximation of where the riverfront occurs on Mr. Wright's property. And that uh, extended at least 100 feet into the area where fill had been placed and graded. And Mr. Wright had uh, not only vehicle parking, but uh, various timbers and other material that he was storing and stockpiling either for future use or for some uh, purpose. And the um, pictometry also bears out uh, a supposition uh, that there's been activity that altered and, uh, and changed and removed vegetation within that regulated area. Now, Mr. Wright, also as I had suggested in the notice of violation, he was good enough to install erosion control. Um, again, I sort of made an assumption looking at the pictometry where I could see piles of fill and, and what appeared to be graded gravel or whatever, that if it wasn't stabilized, that there should be erosion control established. And Mr. Wright um, very appropriately installed erosion control prior to the visit. So the site is currently stable. <coughs> Do you want me to continue? Mm -hmm. okay. um, kind of based, based on the fact that the field inspection uh, verified that there had been activity within regulated wetland resource areas. Um, I shared uh, the thought with Mr. Wright <clears throat> uh, that when he came here tonight that the discussion would probably be directed at recommending that he hire um, professionals to assist him with the possible application uh, to um, appropriately um, gain compliance or at least start by trying to figure out whether the work that he performed on his property was capable of being permitted and whether it adhered to the regulations. The riverfront regulations have a stipulation of um, disturbance can't exceed 10% of the riverfront area on the property. And that information can more than likely only be developed by engaging the services of a professional to probably do uh, some surveying. And then you possibly also would then need uh, the services of a wetlands professional to assist in uh, proposing an application which may either seek to just gain the commission's um, permission through the permitting pr process that should have been engaged um, at the get-go as to what work's been there and possibly addressing the uh, unstable slopes of some of the gravel fill, or if the disturbance has exceeded that 10% criteria that's established under the rec regulations, <clears throat> there may be the possibility that things might uh, Fill material might have to be pulled back or grades changed or, or something. I mean, <clears throat> again, it would the idea would be to move forward on the basis of, of the same appropriate information that you would develop if you were applying to do the grading and the, and the placement of fill so that it. Um, would be in compliance with the regulations. I, uh, if I mind my speaking. Uh, no, you okay. please. I uh, contacted the De Rosa, uh Environmental mm -hmm. Services there, and I met with them Monday, yesterday, and he had a brief look at it, and he suggested that uh, I come to the board meeting tonight, <coughs> hear what your suggestions are, what way you would like to go, and then I can contact him. He'll come up and 
try to finalize whatever we need to get done. Good. You're suggesting we rent the middle of a house well, in a tent? Well, in the context, I believe we need to. Um, I believe we need to behave appropriately where we've discovered that there's been alterations in a regulated wetland resource area for which a permit doesn't exist, and that would be to contemplate the issuance of an enforcement order which basically would confirm the fact that there are activities that were not permitted that have occurred on Mr. Wright's property. And it would direct him, if the commission so chooses, um, I made the suggestion on this copy, um, and it would be found on page three of four, top of the page, under C, order continued, it says complete, and it says attached notice of intent, but we, you know, uh, that can be provided from the internet and stuff. Um, submit that on before June 22nd, 2016, um, and I said for the following, I said allowable activities within the 200 foot riverfront area of Muddy Brook per the regulations because I don't know whether what's occurred on his property is is compliant with the criteria set out on that. I just used the word allowable so that I wouldn't lock any, either the commission or Mr. Wright, into a particular um, plan of action on this. I mean, it may be possible that if he's exceeded the 10% limit on disturbance, that there might have to be some removal and some restoration, some revegetation. But until survey work is done, we don't know that. Well, so. it's, it's, it's more than 10%, and I'll agree with that. Uh, well, I'll part, let you make that statement. Well, why? <laughs> we both know. But, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, thought, I, I, I thought, didn't actually survey it out. And, right. I thought it was 100 foot, I was supposed to stay away from the, and I was just leveling them Well, okay, the 10% criteria refers to the total square footage of your property mm -hmm. and your lot. Oh, yeah, And then the, then the amount of that total square footage of your lot that then is the 200 foot riverfront area, and then it would be 10% of that okay. surveyed riverfront area. So you see, that's still something that we need professional assistance right. in order to get to making uh, that determination. Just would say that these enforcement orders tend to read like they're a little scary, um, but that's just procedural on our part, and, mm -hmm. and it even calls for fines in the event we have a recalcitrant. Um, well, it's like my father always said, stupidity is an excuse. Party in front of us, and generally, it's you know, it's just a matter of working with us. And glad to see that you're yeah. taking oh, no, steps absolutely. to get in touch with people. If it means so, removing the material, so don't feel threatened by this language. And, and uh, and uh, it's unfortunate that these things happen, but people aren't, don't always understand or know all the technical details of our regulations and rules and state laws. So. How did this uh, come up? Was there a complaint there? There was an anonymous complaint, but it was not... Anonymous complaint? Yeah, an anonymous complaint, but it was a tip of the iceberg. It wasn't... Didn't allude to what the actual situation is on the property. So it sounds like um, you'd be going ahead and filing a notice of intent. And are you comfortable within the what is it, the date of June twenty second? Is that what you have in here? Right yeah, now? the June twenty second date is the submittal date for. I think it's our July seventh. Uh, let me just work on the our meeting schedule. It's entirely possible that, um, yeah, that's for our July 7th meeting. Uh, here again, that's just an estimate, an approximate. Okay. Um, if it's completed sooner and capable to be submitted on the June 1st for the June 16th meeting, then that oh, I, can happen uh, too. So. My wife downloaded an application. I don't know if it's the right, it's a nine-page application yeah. for a permit. 
I would suggest fully utilizing Mr. DeRosa's right. okay. services and assistance right. in, okay. in that. The, yes, it sounds like you've probably got the right one. Okay. Um, the instructions to the application are even worse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. So, but again, that's because they have to cover the situation yeah. for all 351 cities and towns throughout mm -hmm. the Commonwealth. So, well, if I have any questions, I'm sure I could contact you. Yeah, either work with Mr. Gross or mm -hmm. also call call myself. Okay. Uh, <coughs> all right. Um, as a matter of form, we typically vote to approve these enforcement orders, so that I believe it's your next step, unless someone has a question. Yes, well, and tonight it would be to issue and confirm based on okay. the information, since we only started off with a notice of violation, but again, the field inspection seems to leave no doubt that there is non-compliance with the Wetlands Protection Act here, and this is the uh, appropriate way to move in the direction of getting Mr. Wright into compliance. And um, comments, questions from the board, from the audience? <coughs> Hearing none, do we hear a motion in accordance with, with uh, what Brett just indicated? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much for your cooperation. <laughs> Thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Wright, is that that email address was was working now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. I gave so, you the wrong one. So I'll time. so I'll email you and I'll copy Mike DeRosa on a scan of this enforcement order, and okay. you will be getting an original copy in the mail. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. Take care. Good night. You too. Sit in the front row. Not sure. Okay. Again, I'll read our agenda item notice of violation at 103 Weldon Farm Road, Map 20, Parcel 3, Lot 46, owned by Glenn T. Holt, altering, alterating, alterating, altering, excuse me. Isolated land subject to flooding by placement of landscaping debris. Brent, would you like to review the status of this part? Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, received a, a complaint, or an anonymous uh, complaint. And I believe I emailed the commission on this originally. So on April 23rd, after uh, driving up Weldon Farm Road and stopping opposite Clay Lane and viewing from the street uh, the public right of way, I noted that there was a significant installation of various bins and fenced enclosures. Uh, containing uh, what appeared to be leaf litter, um, typical organic uh, type material that one would compost, as well as a fairly substantial 
pile uh, that appeared to be wooden branches. It was kind of distance from the road, took some pictures, uh, he sent a uh, notice of violation letter on April 23rd uh, to Mr. Glenn Holt, um, who it turns out I also had previously, the past November, had come into the office um, investigating the possibility of putting a shed on his property. So I actually had already looked up the subdivision plans and had located a plan that had what was depicted on the subdivision plan as being an isolated area subject to flooding, which is a type of resource area that doesn't have an inlet or outlet per se, um, but has to contain, uh, I think it's a quarter acre foot of water. Uh, so it's usually only delineated when you have the services of professional engineering staff to do the calculations and find out that it actually can hold that much water. This type of wetland resource area does not have a buffer zone. Uh, its main significance is the, the fact that it is exposed groundwater and functions as, it can have a function as a potential burning pool area depending upon its duration and the habitat that's around it. Um, this area doesn't necessarily lend any of those particular characteristics. Um, I initially didn't check out the scale on the plan, and when I made my field sketch as to where I thought the installation of, of the landscaping bins and enclosures and stuff were, I thought that was on what the subdivision plan showed as the far side of this area. Uh, upon visiting Mr. Holt on his property, where he was kind enough to allow me to come there, and in the letter I had also made a suggestion about considering the possible relo relocation of the landscaping activities so they wouldn't be in actually in this area. Um, it became apparent that I had vastly, from the street, not being able to make any measurements, had vastly underestimated what the size of this area was and where the landscaping enclosures were located. It actually scales out to be on the subdivision plans 230 feet in length and 60 feet in width at its widest point, um, which in talking with Mr. Holt, I guess it's probably been since 2006 and 2010 and those periods where we sort of had some minimal flooding is probably the last time that it actually probably had water to its fullest extent. Yes. And so, so we met on site and, and Mr. Holt had already uh, you know, thought of a strategy of moving the landscaping activities and the debris material uh, to a different location that was outside. What, since he had lived on the property for quite a while, he was very familiar with where the maximum extent was of where the water is contained. And so I don't want to put words into his mouth, but he showed me a location and suggested that if the commission was fine with his uh, relocating his uh, enclosures or whatever, uh, that, that is his suggested resolution, which uh, again, because of the nature of this particular area, that is uh, the, main, the main goal that the regulations seem to want to achieve is to not have activities occurring there that can negatively affect the groundwater as well as displace it. <clears throat> well, it sounds like you had already begun to make these changes. Uh, you know, we, we talked and agreed to, to uh, move the composting bins uh, further back up the slope where they would be out of the designated uh, the vernal pool. When do you anticipate completion of that process? Uh, he requested that it be done by uh, June, the middle of June, and I've uh, gotten some uh, additional materials to start building some new composting, and then I can start transferring the material. How is that, how is that compost do for you in terms of usability, out of curiosity? 
Oh, it looks, uh, looks like there's a lot of leaf material in it. It's all leaves. Well, there's some garden uh, debris in there. Does it compost well? Yeah, reasonably well. It takes a long time. Uh, I, I do I'm, the same thing. So. I'm pretty <laughs> lax about uh, turning it over. Uh, That's so the big it problem. It takes a couple of extra years if you don't. Uh, it's a lot of work. Take, yeah, I was going to say it's backbreaking work. I do the same thing. <laughs> Turning it is quite an exercise and backbreaking labor sometimes. And you're comfortable with where things stand with regard to uh, mid June? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Yes, I mean, again, this is, um, it's a resource area that depending upon the time of year you encounter it, you might not even know it's there because it doesn't always uh, show the fact that it's um, retaining any water. Uh, so it can dry up and, and look like it's just a dry forest floor. Are we going to need an enforcement order on this? So it's just a matter at this point of um, him letting you know when yes. that's been done and you confirm yeah. it. Yeah, I, I sent an email, which I believe I also copied to the commission, where I went through uh, our site visit and, uh, let's see, how did I put it? I think we said, uh, I requested that he call the office when the relocation process is has been completed and, and the mid-June date is, you know, not a hard and fast date and it's obviously it's only involved some physical labor and stuff and so if, if uh, weather conditions or whatever interfere with that, we certainly um, would allow it, it to occur longer. These really are temporary, I mean these are temporary, we would normally consider these temporary structures. They're, Types of things that basically fence wire is yeah yeah fence wire although there is one hard molded uh, compost bin here okay. and since it's just organic materials we don't get a lot of um, isolated land subject to flooding situations yeah. over the years that Judy and I have been on the <laughs> so it's interesting to see that although when we start looking around for them it's, it is kind of interesting that Rowley does have have a couple of them. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Ashley Ashley Road off of Leslie has a fairly large one that's actually triggered federal jurisdiction there. So much so that the driveway to one of the two lot, one of the houses on the oh, two sorry. lots, is actually almost a circular or a semicircular crescent drive to go around this area. And also that property at the intersection of Boxford Road and Haverhill Street. Miss Sincata property, that ponded area there doesn't have an inlet or outlet. And it's mostly on the abutting property, but that more than likely is also an isolated um, land subject to flooding. Do you need a motion or any kind? Um, I don't see that you do. No, that. but I, but I think, um, I think some acknowledgement of uh, Mr. Holt uh, being um, <coughs> responsive uh, to the concerns and, and that um, we're all in, in agreement about the approximate timeline and that it's <coughs> not a hard and fast date would just, um, just establish that, um, that the resolution of the concern uh, for these activities is uh, amenable to both parties. How's that? <laughs> Anybody have any suggestions for anything different? All right, I think we have that amenability. <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation and attendance tonight. Thank you. Thanks. And we've reduced the audience down to the tower people. <laughs> Hopefully not the tower.
Tower of Power. Tower of Power. Tower of Power. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Babel. Babel. But you're a rock and roll fan. Well, that was a, I grew up with rock and roll. <laughs> Somehow I never fully participated. <laughs> oh, the Marsh Tower. Okay. Yes. Yep. Reading from the agenda, this is Order of Conditions, DEP number 63-0624 for Land Office Stackyard Road, Map 36 Parcel Slash Lot 1, owned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, issued to Marine Bi Biological Labs, P-I-E-L-T-E-R, that's an abbreviation for an acronym for something, I don't remember what I remember reading it. A request to relocate an instrument tower to Salt Marsh, known as Low Country, Map 37, Parcel Slash Lot 25, owned by Mass Department of Fish and Game. Like lead off yeah, I guess I better since this is <laughs> not the usual request that we have. Um, <clears throat> So not to, not to diminish the significance of a structure in Salt Marsh, but after, when the Commission issues a permit, our issued order of conditions, uh, which are duly recorded, reference the location, and, and location is usually very important to environmental regulations since you make determinations as to what resource areas are possibly being impacted, where your activities are taking place, what resource areas are associated with the primary resource area that the activity may be in, or in some cases where you have a layer cake of different resource areas, you can have an activity, or in this case, a, a, a small structure that's placed that may uh, possibly impact a number of different resource areas. In this particular instance, we have salt marsh, we have uh, coastal land subject to uh, flooding, or coastal storm flowage, excuse me, is how it, it's um, expressed. And we have an area of critical environmental concern. I think that's the three main ones that the actual <coughs> towers are situated in. So, in and Giblin can correct me because, but basically, in sampling the gaseous uh, vapors developed from Spartina alterniflora and Peyton's or whatever, um, it was deemed that there was a better location or a location to gather different data for the tower. And so, one piece of salt marsh. Um, or one tower location in Salt Marsh was desired to be relocated to another piece of Salt Marsh on what turned out to be different ownership. At first we thought it was the town, uh, but the town just last year sold it to uh, Department of Fish and Game because they were interested in some kind of NACA national grant. They needed certain acreages of Salt Marsh, and so they approached the town and they bought this parcel. So where we are in trying to figure out how to do this, in my discussions with the Department of Environmental Protection, it was thought that if we solely demonstrated that we had permission from the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife to relocate the tower there, and because this is an area that has estimated habitat, I think, I think it's terms they're concerned about. And so natural heritage has been contacted. Um, they had also, when they commented on the original application, they had specifically put in a uh, condition that if there was a change in location that they'd be contacted so that they could reevaluate um, to see whether there would be any possible impacts or concerns from a different location of one of these towers. They have not responded, but they have um, been applied to. Um, Division of Fishery Wildlife um, just today um, extended um, their written uh, approval for the relocation. And anticipate, well, so 
in one sense, this can't be 100% resolved tonight because we haven't heard from the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. But I would think the Commission could act if they wish to contingent upon that communication and only bring it back before the board if Natural Heritage expresses that there's some kind of concern. I can't imagine that they would, but anyway. <laughs> Who, who, what town granted the original permission? Was it us, us or Newbury? Or? No, it was us. Pardon? Yeah, yeah they are lo located in the um, the two towers that were originally established by both. This is actually, I should have given you this one. This is a somewhat better map. It shows where the two towers are now and where we're moving it to. Is that in your packet originally? No, it wasn't. I, I, this no, is okay. what I sent to Mass Heritage. Mm -hmm. How long ago was that? Uh, that? I finally contacted them on Friday, so I don't know what the... No, I mean that when we originally... Oh, just two, two years ago. Yeah. Okay. Uh, don't. No, we issued on July 9th, 2013. Huh. I thought I read in here when I read this originally uh, what your reason was for moving this particular one, but could you refresh yeah, the, the but We have two towers and both of them are really s largely sampling salt marsh hay, which is the dominant vegetation in, in the marsh, and so that seemed like the right thing to do, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that part of the, the marsh is switching over to more cord grass, more alterniflora, so we wanted to <coughs> investigate that and also most of the other sites along the East Coast are dominated by cord grass. And there's a tower in Virginia and a tower in Georgia, and this will enable us to compare our data to theirs quite a bit more effectively. Thank you for refreshing my memory on that. Very impressive tower. Commissioners have any problems with this relocation or questions or encouragement? <laughs> um. Actually, you'll probably be uh, with less marsh disturbance because you'll be, be able to check that one from a boat a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Subject to the uh, one open item approval has to come in, and Brent's concurrence in that. And we can, think we can delegate that to you. Right. Any further comments? No, just that recognizing that if there is a concern for natural heritage, that would require a, a re you know, a revisit to the commission to discuss whatever. I'm hoping they wouldn't just say no and not give any guidance as to, oh, if you shifted it, you know, north, south, east, or west, or... But. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable it's not... Well, yeah, I, 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 I think that whole area of salt marsh is, is turned foraging area and not necessarily where they're nesting at all, which, which is why I don't think the towers ever raised an issue to begin with, was that they don't impede the turns from foraging or whatever, and they're certainly not perched on an area that at, where they're actively nesting, so I don't... But you know they attract snowy owls. <laughs> the turns attract snowy owls? Logan yeah. attracts yeah. snowy yeah. owls. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the turns might also. <laughs> I don't know how a snowy owl could perch on that thing. Maybe in one of the arms there. there. <laughs> Having seen them on telephone poles on Palm Island Causeway, I <coughs> not, not an insignificant looking bird. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're all fluffing feathers. Um, I assume turn, turns are 
fish eating birds and not fly catches or correct. Either? Okay. Yeah. Um, Probably maybe small arthropods too. Well, if anything, but anyway, yeah. it would give them a perk from which to survey the field for fish or the water for fish. Anyway, do I hear a motion to approve the plan of action here? That's so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And unanimous. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Thank you. Appreciate your coming in. This is my very capable crew of power installers. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you here. You've all lived up here on Route 1 for the summer? Actually, we, we uh, we'll also stay at the Rally House owned by Greenbelt. <coughs> Oh, so okay. we occupy both properties. Out on, out on the river. Yeah. yeah. That's a nice, nice location. Great place. Yeah. Enjoy the summer. Thank you very much. Dyke Street? Sure. Dyke Street. Yes, it's a Dyke Street. It's my drift. Is that it? Oh, is it? Oh, wait. It's going right across the marsh on the dike while we're Yes, it actually designated Dyke Street. There's streets on there. It was never named. I mean, uh, yeah, I think Todd was a part of Georgia, but the yeah. Red Gate for the last yeah, well, it's four to five years I've been there. Benefit of the folks at home, this takes us back to our first major agenda item, which is a discussion of proposed warrant article to designate tax title land at land off Dyke Street, map 30, parcel slash lot 29, town of Rowley with 3.9974 acres to be placed into custody and care of the Conservation Commission as protected by Article 97 as open space. Yeah. All right, I'll have to clear up the acreage because, yeah, I've got one assessor's thing that says 2.62. Yeah, and I looked that up and it said 3.99. So I will resolve that. Well, let's, let's assume we're talking about acreage between 2.62 and 3.99 for the sake of yeah. motions and other things in the record. Uh, so it's not to get hung up on a specific right. item. Uh, would you like to summarize? This subject, print, please. Sure. Well, actually, uh, read my memo dated today. The commissioners may wish to consider submitting a request to the Board of Selectmen to support transfer tax title land consisting of 2.62 to 3.99 acres of salt marsh shown on Accessors Map, Map 30, Blocker Lot 29 at Land Off Dyke Street to the Conservation Commission for protection of natural resource values. The assessor's records indicate the property was taken around 1962 to 1964. According to the town of Potometry, the property is entirely salt marsh and thus not readily supportive of development activity. An article on the next town meeting warrant should also be considered. The proposed article, whatever number, would read to see if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to transfer a tax title land consisting of 2.62 or 3.99 acres of land as shown on Assessor's Map 30, Block or Lot 29 at Land Off Dyke Street to the Raleigh Conservation Commission for conservation purposes under provisions of Mass General Laws Chapter 40, Section 8C, as it may from time to time be amended and subject to the purposes and protections of Article 97 of the amendments to the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or to take any action relative thereto. Um, Arthur, you say this street is now known as Red Gate Lane? Or well, <coughs> that originally, you went all the way up through Carmody's property, 
I originally went across was at Stone Dyke. You'd still see it at low tide. It's still a little high. Um, it's flat enough to they mow it uh, for salt hay. It's currently hay. But then it would cross, this is pre-railroad tracks, when it was a dike. It would actually end up um, like that driveway behind, um, as you start down Redgate, that's where it came out. Um, the railroad tracks obviously yeah, blocked, that, that segment so it couldn't, yeah, and that's when it, it just, I don't think it was probably, I don't know when the railroad was in, but that's what stopped that road. And then because they filled uh, 1A, they made 1A, but that was pre-1A, pre, when it was made, the railroad pretty much put it out. Okay. Uh, yeah, the address is, is what the assessors yeah. show in their, in their records, so I, yeah. I defer to their records on these things, although obviously I've got to resolve what's going on with the acreage here. It's excellent mash. Currently hay, it's been hay for years. Who hays it? Um, right now, Robert Colby hays it. Um, before that, it was Jack Campbell. Um, the, ac the only access to it is uh, through Mr. Conley's land, but he's all for you know keeping the marsh in good shape. Whenever it's hayed, you don't get any Phragmites or any of the other invasives, yeah. and uh, it's very good, very solid. How is it determined who is the hayer? <laughs> um, <clears throat> usually, the farmer just goes around. And everybody wants your marsh cut. <laughs> But, who, uh, who owns it now? And I don't think anybody owns it right now. It's yeah, the government. Yeah, government. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think they got it through abandonment. Yes. Okay. Who abandoned it? <laughs> Pretty much everybody out there. You have no access to people it. Have, people have done that over, over the years. Frank L. Merrill. <coughs> Frank who? Okay. Frank, Frank L. Merrill. Merrill. The reason I'm asking is because... 1911. Um, Steve Conway Sr. last night um, uh, raised an issue with regard to the item that was approved uh, on a similar kind of situation, um, a conservation of the property, and uh, just needed clarification that it was the rule of the wetlands, and, and there were no further questions, but um, people are going to wonder where this is and, and uh, what's going on along a similar nature, but in any event. Um, no, I'm quite Can familiar with it. Well, these these, it? these properties are appropriately <coughs> vetted. Oh yes, I for know. Yeah. for their potential to uh, return revenue to the town since they um, have ceased to be uh, generating any any tax. Uh, well, I explained revenue. to him last night that uh, after he sat down, that um, I was sitting right behind him, that that there was some you know we reviewed something like 22 parcels one night of this, yeah. and these there yeah. were only two that that were wetlands. And, made sense right. in terms of doing this. And this one, because it was entirely salt marsh, both the assessors and the treasurer's office contacted me because they couldn't see sending it through that process when the result was going to be that it's environmentally sensitive and, and doesn't have any development capabilities or, or potential. Nor does it provide <coughs> access to anything either. So There actually was a hunting camp on that one, I was at kid. Hmm. Um, a lot of them were like that stack yeah, they were just built on the marsh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Yep. I see it. That's a pond in Conley's field. Is that what that is? Yep. Okay. I didn't realize that. I didn't know exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. But let's see. Now. Okay. Um. What do we need to do here with this? Um, Approve the warrant article. Yeah. Well, if the, yeah, if the, well, so this would be to make a request to the selectmen mm -hmm. and to recommend and support if the if the selectmen agree to support the placement of an article on an upcoming town meeting as as I prepare the draft in the uh, articles language. With the acreage clarified. Yeah. From what we have before us. Yeah. Well, again, I got both of those figures through the assessor, so I have to go see which, no, they give which one's the real one. Which are one? they giving this to the town? No, we already have taken it. We've already yeah. taken it. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's, How come it's just right now, it's general municipal property. I thought the government's giving up land. They've been no, the government is not giving up land. It's not it was in private ownership. Oh. 
and back in 19, somewhere between 1911 and 1962 to 64, the owner of record ceased to pay his municipal okay. obligations on it and there it was again. taken for back taxes. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Do I hear a motion to proceed accordingly? So moved. Second? Anybody? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Negatives? None? Unanimous. <coughs> I'm sorry, who seconded that? I did. Yes, thank you. Aerial pictometry of photographs is really a nice aid in assisting our deliveries. Ah, uh, yes. Especially taking that time to get Yeah. Especially since it's quite a hike to get out there. So. <laughs> oh, you can drive right there. Good. You may be able to drive right there. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> My Civic would not yeah. think the same thing. <laughs> no, your two feet could take you. Yes. Well, I actually do much rather walk out there. Much more interesting. Okay. There are some status reports. Here, may, but may I go to an administrative Absolutely. item that isn't necessarily on the agenda because it's got a request for emergency certification? Sure. Uh, Doug and Kurt were initially copied um, or contacted on this um, so that I could react to the request of the, of the property owner, uh, which was made on behalf of uh, Bruce Tompkins, the request was made by John DeCoulos and it's the ice pond dam where he installed a water flow control device a few years ago that the beavers rendered rather quickly non-functional due to its unique design and as part of their request for being able to remove dam material <coughs> from the Stone Sluice Way, I also said and was supported by Doug and Kurt on this and said that they were going to be required to restore the functioning of the water flow control device. We never, or we denied the issuance of a certificate of compliance for that order of conditions because the water flow control device was not being maintained and was not functioning. Uh, it, became dislodged. I was going to say, you can see the pipe sticking up at a 45 degree angle out of the, uh, out of the pond surface there um, because it wasn't um, adequately anchored and uh, like I said, had a unique construction methodology too, which I think uh, may have contributed to it not being as durable as some that I've seen. But anyway, the request is um, for the commission to consider uh, confirming an emergency certification that I issued that um, was issued to allow the temporary breaching of an existing beaver dam within the Stone Sluiceway of Ice Pond, Earth and Burn at a tributary stream to the Mill River to relieve risk of catastrophic release of impounded water and restore functioning of the water flow control device to prevent flooding of stormwater management system of the road. Um, on the assessor's map sheet, there is an area you can see here, the red dotted area is the drainage easement. That's where uh, the stormwater system for Emily uh, Lane uh, goes down to the freshwater marsh. The water's driven, risen so much that it's come up the treatment swale, the grass swale. That is where the discharge is supposed to slowly work its way through before it gets to the bordering vegetated wetlands and then gets to the pond. But right now, because the pond waters have been risen, it almost immediately contacts the pond water directly, which is no, no treatment at all. So. Yeah. And this little group continues northerly through the golf course. Yeah, it goes to the three ponds in the golf course and then to the lower river. So the um, special conditions uh, that are expressed in the certificate are the dam breaching must occur 
in phases three, approximately a week apart, is restricted to the stone sluiceway of the earthen berm and should be done before 10 a.m. each day or at the latest by 1 p.m. to be effective. First day of the breach may be no, no larger than six feet wide by six inches deep, only centered on the stone sluiceway. Breaching will be conducted in a controlled manner to minimize downstream flooding, prevent erosion and sediment, and avoid rapid wetland change. A copy of the permit must be carried. And on site, woody debris from the dam should be scattered into the woods outside the 100 foot buffer zone <coughs> of the nearby wetlands and hay mulch and hay mulch available for soil disturbance on the woods road because I assumed when they came down the slope to go to this crossing that that was, um, it was very wet or whatever because of the recent rains and I figured they were just going to disturb that surface from the equipment coming in so I wanted them to be able to mulch it when they left and when they were done. Is that, and that tree just happened to fall there, or was it felled there? No, it, it just happened to fall there. Interesting. <coughs> um, okay, you're looking for what here? Approval of Con the confirmation of the issuance of the emergency certification. Okay. As just read. Any more questions? Discussion? Do I have a motion to that effect to confirm? So moved. Second? No second. All in favor? Right. Okay. Opposed? Is there, is there a lot of beaver activity there? On? No. No. Just, look just the usual. Dead. Yeah. Just the usual amount, to be honest with you. Um, as a matter of interest, uh, to me anyway, the, uh, the development uh, of, um, of condos or whatever they are comes back from from uh, Daniel's Road there next to the uh, wagon wheel factory. Uh, oh, Marion Way, yes, subdivision of 40B? has been disapproved by, by the uh, Board of Appeals, the Zoning Board of Appeals, oh, really? with a huge, thick file. With, and I think it did I back. Did I email you? Yeah, yeah, the PDF of, the, yeah. of their decision? Well, I don't know yeah. if everybody read that or not, but um, I don't know. I assume they will appeal that to the courts, but um, at this point of time, that's where that stands. <coughs> the Board of Appeals opinion is an interesting read. The detail it goes into and covers a period of time, which is a lengthy administrative burden to have to deal with. Let's go this way. <laughs> <coughs> talk about any of these other enforcement orders that are pending? Notice the violations? Well, why, why don't I, um, oh, okay, sure. I, mean, I don't know if we have to dwell on them, but they're not on no. the agenda, but just a brief mention to get them in the minutes. Well, and that's, and that's just, well, and that's because they're, you know, very recent and I haven't had any contact 
um, by the property owner yet, so I certainly would appreciate it. So, during my start of the review of the boundary of the former Girl Scout property where it abuts Kirk Turner's I'm property. I'm choose myself on this. What you're talking about? Well, no action is comp. I know, is but I, I don't even, shouldn't even hear what the discussion is. Okay. Sam, would you take over the temporary duties of chairing, if there's any chairing that needs okay. to be done? <laughs> I'm not sure what chairing is. No, the, well, there probably isn't, because really I just no going to review it, because again, yep. the uh, property owner hasn't contacted me, but I just want the commission to just be in general aware. So, what happened? So in walking the boundary of the Girl Scout property, which is um, also abuts um, Mr. Uh, Daniel R. Graham's property, I noted that there were a number of cut tree stumps um, in close proximity to Batch Elder Brook, i.e. they're in the 200-foot riverfront area. Mr. Graham previously had had a situation in 2005 uh, where he was issued an enforcement order for uh, unpermitted activities in the 200-foot riverfront area of Batch Elder Brook uh, where he was uh, directed by the commission to um, hire a wetlands professional and, and submit an application for the grading and clearing and grading that he was doing. So from that, we developed survey plans, which you see a small uh, section uh, in front of you tonight. I just want to point out um, for folks that may not look at these photographs and do interpret to well, so you can see from the standing hardwood trees that have no leaves, you can see the shadows that are generated. So the sun is over in this direction to the east. It's, it's in the morning. Uh, well, no, but it does catch one of the trees yeah. that was cut because you can you can not only see the circular cut stump but you can see the whole trunk and bowl of the tree and you can see that it's sectioned up and it, you can tell that it's on the ground because it is not casting a shadow mm -hmm. on that. You see that one, Judy? Yeah. So there's the cut stump, there's the tree trunk on the ground, there's it sectioned, mm -hmm. sectioned up. So the photograph actually caught. In the end. Um, so well, because the other ones have been removed. So when I saw the property just recently, all I could see was the circular flush cut stumps um, in two areas that I indicated on the plans. Um, I didn't bother, I took some photographs, but I didn't bother to print them out tonight because this is actually more descriptive than the photos mm. that I took because you can just see these sort of pale white circular areas on the ground. And because I'm viewing it from at least 100 feet away over uh, on the Girl Scout property where, of course, I can be because it's now town property and under our custody and care. <clears throat> so, so I've, I've uh, distributed a copy to you of the enforcement order that was sent in the mail. I reviewed the file and also included a notice of violation of the conditions of the previously issued order because that order hasn't been closed out. So that's that's all I needed to review with you. Hopefully, uh, by next meeting, I will have heard from the property owner, and he will be invited to come in and appear before the commission and discuss uh, a pathway of returning to compliance. And that 2005 was uh, also an enforcement. It started order. off as an enforcement order, yeah. yes. And, yeah. and again, because it was a riverfront situation, he was directed to complete an application so yeah. that we could measure his activities against the standard of the regulations and see, and it, and it turned out that what he was doing uh, was, the commission allowed it to be done, but it obviously yeah. needed to be stabilized, you needed yeah. to use erosion control, needed to be revegetated. We just don't know if that 
got completed because he never applied for a certificate of compliance. Mm -hmm. And he's had a significant amount of time because your order of conditions lab is its normal term is three years. Well, the Permanent Extension Act came along and gave him an extra four. So it's actually yeah. been seven years and actually longer because it's, it's expired even with that four-year uh, special extension granted by the legislature. <clears throat> so that's all on that particular situation. Kurt, would you like to return? For sure. Sure. Under the category as under the heading, when you go to town meeting, you never know what you're going to find on the way in the driveway of Pine Grove School. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is Parker River Community Preschool, and for whatever reason they decided to go into the woods at the rear of their property, which happens to border the town Pine Grove School property in the exact area behind the, is that a congregational church? Mm -hmm. yes. Where there's a potential vernal pool that we had the application to have skating conducted on it. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. to be a skating point, yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, Stu Dalzell, and someone else were going to uh, and had uh, had done some modifications to possibly make it so it could be skated on. But but anyway, uh, so there's there's a definite resource area there, and I had heard from a number of teachers that it was a potential vernal pool, and they've been clearing and uh, chipping and removing all the understory uh, vegetation, and they've gone into the 100-foot buffer zone. Uh, of the bordering vegetated wetlands along the edge of that freshwater pond, which also could potentially be the 100-foot um, vernal that, pool habitat. Are that, that close to the pond? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It looks like it's quite a ways. Well, it, it's not. If you actually measure it out, um, they're, they're 30 to 40 feet into the 100-foot buffer zone, at least. Uh, I sort of paced it off. I didn't actually measure it. Because I didn't have permission to enter onto their property, so I had to stay and view it from the school property. I stopped in there this morning and delivered the notice of violation letter. I requested the um, supervisor of their building, who wasn't in at the time, to give me a call, and I did not receive any call today. So there's also been a letter mailed uh, since the assessor's list says uh, Parker River Realty as the owner of the property. So they had a hand delivery and have received, uh, or, or will receive, a first class letter. <clears throat> Anybody know where they were located before they moved to Rowley? Somewhere closer to the Parker River, for the moment? I don't know. Yeah, they're a long way from the Parker River. <laughs> <laughs> We used to complain about everybody naming everything in town after the Mill River, even though they weren't anywhere near. <laughs> So that may be a case of that too, but probably not. So anyway, those are uh, two two reasons. Hmm? 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 And the frogs are chorusing from that wetland, so it very well could be functioning as a vernal pool which means the commission under our bylaw um, usually imposes a, a no, cut, no disturbance area within what would normally be the 100 foot buffer zone. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, until I have a discussion with them, I've, I've, uh, I've tried to open the lines of communication that have not been responded to as to that. Um, we have the 845 uh, status reports.
or uh, right on top, conservation areas. Um, so the status report with the Bradstreet Farm conservation area conservation restriction is that Mass Audubon also had a change in employee status and we have gotten back on track um, with that and the status is that the few changes that needed to be made to the document based on feedback from the Executive Office of Energy and the Environment um, have been done. I'm right now engaged in a review with a, another person in the Land Management Office of Mass Audubon for the baseline report. And they've uh, sent me a draft, I reviewed it, uh, made a couple changes in response to my comments and I need to uh, review those changes. So we believe, I'm going to check, we believe that the document needs to be sent back in to um, Energy and the Environment Affairs Office for the Secretary's signature and I believe they want the baseline report to accompany that so I'm going to try and have review of the baseline report um, done. Maybe not for sure by the end of this week but at least by the first of next week. So that hopefully will result in it being in whatever queue then for get, obtaining the secretary's signature and, and then it would be ready for recording. Great. Good. Where was the new employee at the state level? No, um, no, Bob Ford um, actually left the employee of Mass Audubon. He was a gentleman that met with us. And yeah. He was very good to work with. Who did he yeah. come? Um, well, okay. no, it, it, it's okay. He, he shared it with me, and I don't think it's, you know, it isn't, yeah. isn't that personal, whatever. I believe either one of his elderly parents or one of his wife's elderly parents, they're going to be providing care, and he decided that huh. he lives, um, oh, where did somebody tell me? somewhere in southern New Hampshire over towards um, the, not not Jaffrey, but but over in that area. So he was like commuting to Lincoln. And then when he'd meet with us, he'd be coming up here yeah. and then going way back out past past Orange and then, and then north into New Hampshire, I think. So that's quite a haul. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah, I've driven the two out there too. Uh, uh, so that's that. So that's uh, the Bradstreet Farm situation. Wild pasture estates. <clears throat> I think I sent this around, uh, I think, via email. So this um, so the dark blue line represents the trail system that I have put trail markers up on. The trail system then goes over here, comes around, and comes back into the roadway here. So depending upon how these different spurs react, you can either say I've done at least half of it or maybe I've done two-thirds. And I've got either a third or a good half left to do, but I think it's much less than a half. I took the opportunity at the same time that I was doing the Wild Pastures Trail. This is one of our open space parcels within the um, um, West, West Fox Pastures Village yeah. development. So I put boundary markers on the boundary. I put those up at the same time I was putting the trail markers. Um, it's a very uh, it's a very distinctive boundary because it has a nice stone wall or whatever. And of course, since Wild Pastures isn't that old a development, their survey markers were still up too. So I was very comfortable that I wasn't putting markers on somebody else's real estate. Right. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So. Should now be renamed Tame Pastures. Yeah. 
Um, so I did encounter, you may want to pass this around, I did encounter the fact that we are having the potential of an issue with inappropriate disposal of grass clippings from the new inhabitants or residents of wild pasture estates. And so um, our senior service person, June Blanchard, and I are working on uh, drafting a communications piece that we would send as kind of a bulk mailing to all the residents in wild pastures to talk about protected conservation restricted areas and not disposing. This particular dumping of grass clippings is particularly obnoxious because it is at least 40 feet away from the rear boundary of the residence that I believe it originated from. It is in the no, the 25 foot no cut, no disturbance area because it's less than an arm's length from dark saturated soils and skunk cabbage coming up, meaning that it's almost in bordering vegetative wetlands. It's on the other side of the path. The trail tries to respect the 25 foot no cut, no disturbance zone in most cases. So it's even past the trail. So they had to come into the woods, go past the trail, go to that down tree on the very edge of the wetlands to throw the grass clippings there. It's quite a hike. Um, and so why is that a bad thing? Well, it's bad for a couple of reasons. First off, you don't know what the lawn has been treated with. So you don't know what the burden is of of possible um, weed control things or or types of herbicides, you don't. You also have the issue of smothering. So any ground cover that was growing there naturally, which may have a hard time to begin with, has now been smothered with grass clippings. And because they're mounded up and they stay dry and they aren't well dispersed, they are just going to persist there for a relatively long period of time instead of being composted as they could have been or set to some other appropriate location or kept on the property owner's parcel. Is there a DNA test for grass? <laughs> <laughs> probably not because you probably find out you're in violation of the, uh, if you read the fine print on like Scots and stuff, you'll find that because their grass is genetically engineered that you actually have a whole bunch of prohibitions against it. You are not supposed Good to allow point. it to go to seed. Yeah. You're not supposed to, to handle it or distribute it in any manner once you've purchased it. Uh, it's it's frightening actually if you read the restrictions on it's ridiculous on copyrighted grass. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They've okay. got two Jersey barriers currently blocking it. Oh. Um, now that the road's been accepted, I don't know if those will end up now being removed or yeah. or not. But okay. uh, but yes, it has been paved. Uh, well, and I'm not qualified to say whether it was finished paved, but I can tell you it's paved because actually I parked my car right next to the Jersey barriers when I did the trail system because that was a good halfway point for me to go into each side of that part of the development. I thought the discussion at town meeting was interesting on that subject because yes, there's a homeowners association there and they, they you know, quite vehemently opposed to town approval of of the, of the road, and um, if they were if they were a really good homeowners association, they should have had an attorney representing them, and the attorney should have should have had them be prepared with an amendment to the warrant article that would have you know required a vote on the amendment, which which didn't none of that happened, and they you know the, the problem for those that haven't heard of this, the problem was that they felt that, and I'm not saying that's incorrect. They felt that the uh, grass along the side of the road and the sidewalks was not up to standard. Well, it hadn't even, in some cases, it hasn't even, it hasn't germ even germinated been. because he hasn't yeah, hydro okay. seeded it. Okay. He finished the, finished the curbing and some of the sidewalk paving 
right in November, so there was no opportunity. Yeah. And they yeah. also felt some of the loam was substandard too. Yeah. It was too thin. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. I can attest to that that some of the areas I walked there, there was no grass cover at all. But those are areas that are outside our jurisdiction, which is why it wasn't an issue when we were asked for a certificate of compliance. <clears throat> Okay. Last but not least, Hunsley Hills Conservation Area. And we have part of our uh, Earth Day cleanup crew in attendance this evening. What, what day is it? Um, we did this on um, this past Saturday morning. Saturday. So, so this is the multi-trunked blowdown that blocked the brand new trail that had been established there. So that's what we worked on. And if you want to rotate that photograph, cycle it through. Um, Before and after? So, oh. Well, a little bit. Um, while, while Sue and I were waiting for folks to come in, um, the kiosk has been updated and Sue cleaned the sign. You will notice a distinct change mm -hmm. in brightness of the uh, sign showing that we've gotten monies from the state to help preserve this. And you also know that the old faded mm -hmm. map is gone and, and the, uh, the, the, the new trail map. Right? That's the new trail map and it's got the new revised text that give you some distances of the trails. So the kiosk has all been updated. And here's most of the trail crew um, extraordinaire that did uh, a yeoman's amount of work. Who are the people besides you, yourself and Sue? Um, well, Keith and his girlfriend Brooke and Sue Bailey, an accountant, being joined. Oh, well, that's good. And here's the end result. Oh, here's the after. A four-footed volunteer. Uh, Zeus. Yes. <laughs> Zeus was there. Keith and Brooks' dog. It was very good. Well, I'm looking for a vote of strong appreciation for the work done Absolutely. on this Earth Day by the crew involved, and uh, Brent and his wife continue to shine in this regard. Do I have a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let the minutes so reflect. Good job. One and all. A lot of hard work over big, big cuttings. Thank you. So many things were going on. Getting back into the timber business. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the whole